I'd like to welcome everyone to the Mixed Methods webinar series today for February 7th, 2017. The Mixed Methods webinar series is brought to you in part by the Mixed Methods International Research Association, as well as the University of Alberta's International Institute for Qualitative Methodology. I'll just go over. So today's webinar is to publish or not to publish a guide to securing publication in the International Journal of Multiple Research Approaches perspectives from the Editor-in-Chief, and our presenter today is Dr. Tony Onweg Buzzi. So um, Anthony J. Onweg Buzzi is Professor in the Department of Educational Leadership at Sam Houston State University, where he teaches doctoral level courses in qualitative, quantitative, and mixed research. Further, he is Distinguished Visiting Professor at the University of Johannesburg. His research areas primarily involve social and behavioral science topics including disadvantaged and underserved populations such as minorities, children living in war zones, students with special needs, and juvenile delinquents. Additionally, he writes extensively on an array of qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methodological topics. With a current H index of 74, Professor Anwai Buzi has secured the publication of more than 400 works, including more than 300 journal articles, 50 book chapters, and five books. Additionally, he has delivered more than 900 presentations and 200 methodological workshops worldwide and more than 50 keynote addresses across six continents. He has received numerous outstanding paper awards. Professor Amit Buzi is former editor of Educational Research, being part of the editorial team from 2006 to 2010, has secured a first impact factor of 3.774. Currently, he is Editor-in-Chief of the Mixed Methods Journal, International Journal of Multiple Research Approaches, and co-editor of Research in the Schools. Many of Professor Anwai Buzi's articles have been extensively read and cited. For example, his Mixed Methods Research article published in EER not only has, the most, has been the most read for the past 10 years, is currently the most cited ER article ever. Also, one of his mixed Research articles published in the Journal of Mixed Methods Research is the most cited Journal of Mixed Methods Research article ever. He is also the current president of the Mixed Methods Research International Association. His overall goal is to be a role model for beginning researchers and students worldwide. Tony, we're very happy to have you here with us here today. Tony? So thank you, Beth, for organizing this, and um, thanks to all the members of IIQM um, for, for the series that they've developed. Um, <clears throat> so much further ado, um, I move on. So this is the journal um, I'm going to be talking about today. I, however, um, a lot of the things I say, you know, when we get on to the, you know, strategies and guidelines will be applicable to other um, journals that publish mixed method research, like the Journal of Mixed Method Research. Um, and so, <clears throat> so hopefully this is, this is broader than, than maybe the title suggests. All right, so just a little bit of history about IJMRA or the International Journal of Multi Research Approaches. Just by pure coincidence, um, it started exactly the same time as the Journal of Mixed Methods Research in 2007, um, and uh, which was, which was uh, I think, quite an amazing coincidence. <coughs> and during that period, um, it was much needed because we had the handbook that came out at the, about Tasha Corey and Charles Tedley um, edited, and so there was lots of enthusiasm going on and, and momentum. So um, journals were a good a very good timing for us. So in the mixed method research community. Um, <clears throat> it was out of Australia, the publishers of International Journal of Multiple Research Approaches called eContent Management. And they ended up publishing eight volumes between 2000 before it was taken over by Taylor and Francis Routledge in 2015. They published, um, unfortunately, only published one volume. <coughs> and after just one year, 
decided to cease publication, which we never really found out a reason why, although I was in communication with them. Um, anyway, I'm sure it was a business decision. Um, so after lots of different uh, emails back and forth, um, asking them, you know, almost begging them to continue the series and uh, continue the journal because we were very uncomfortable with just having one mixed method journal. Um, they contacted me and, and told me that they would be happy to, um, for free, give me the, the deeds to the journal, which um, I uh, happily and gratefully accepted. So <clears throat> last year it laid dormant because that was a period when we were negotiating. But now, this year, 2017, I'm excited to announce that um, quite soon, we'll be relaunching um, this journal. <coughs> and even though we have a totally new team, we didn't want to confuse everyone by starting with, you know, volume one, issue one, because there already was a volume one, issue one, unless we were to change the name, which we decided not to, but to continue on with volume 10. So we have that continuity. I wanted to <clears throat> do a shout out to my department chair, who is partly sponsoring um, the journal. Uh, that's um, Dr. or Professor Anthony Harris. <coughs> I also want to uh, acknowledge my co-editors. In fact, we had a very nice two-hour meeting this morning um, and made some good progress with the journal, which I'll, which I'll be sharing. So you have Burke Johnson, John Hitchcock, Bridget Smith, Vanessa Sherman, and Dongle Simon. They are pictures of them, um, for those who might not know them. <coughs> um, we, uh, we have an in-joke about uh, how good-looking John Hitchcock is, and um, I think I made a mistake putting myself next to him, because, you know, it's like Beauty and the Beast. But that's the way it goes. Someone had to be next to him. So anyway, um, very, very exciting team. We also have eight associates. And it's as you can see from different parts of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. Australia, Caribbean, Africa, um, US, UK. So, um, so this hopefully should encourage those of you who are thinking about submitting to our journal that this truly is an international journal. Um, so we, and we'd like our publication to reflect that in the coming months and years. Another exciting um, announcement I'd like to make is our first issue, which we're calling an inaugural issue. We're going to make it a special issue. That way, we kind of um, gives us time to get manuscripts for our second issue. But even more so, it gives us time to kind of really, I mean, gives us opportunity to really uh, announce um, how special our journal is going to be. So we have going to have a lot of manuscripts. We already have a lot of them submitted, and uh, it's going to be a huge issue. It's going to be almost like a handbook that we're going to put online <coughs> of many of the, the top leading mixed method researchers. I would name them, but I, I'd be afraid to forget someone um, important out. So, but I'm sure you can guess some of the names that uh, we all cite. And also, we're going to make it open access. Um, thereafter, it's for the most part, it's going to be a non-open access journal, so it will be subscription kind of based. But this very first one, we are going to put online. So we're going to have more than 20, 25 um, manuscripts, and we're going to uh, put them in themes so that um, you could easily kind of pick and choose which ones you want to read. Um, so we're very, 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 very excited about that. Um, we're also the, at the moment developing the website. It's going to be ijmra.org, ijmra.org. But if you go there now, it will say probably say it currently under construction. But uh, in in a few weeks, we'll have it. Um, we're now populating it at present, and we'll have it up and going soon. And uh, it will hopefully look like a standard um, a journal website. Um, and then issue two, volume 10, will begin our regular publications. 
I'm going to operate using a quadruple blind process. <coughs> As you see there. So, so when you submit a manuscript to us, um, we will make sure the reviewers are not aware of the identity of the authors, which is standard for, for most journals. Um, also, we'll make sure the co editors are not aware of the authors. Um, you know, the, the, the social editors might know, but, but certainly um, we're still talking about that aspect, but the co editors certainly won't know when they're making the decision. Um, and then the um, co editors won't be aware of the review identification as well. We'll keep that blind enough. They are capable of managing editor Don Gill, that you saw earlier, would uh, make sure that that would happen. And then the authors, of course, would not be aware of the reviewers. So I think this will, um, most journals have maybe a double blind, but we're going to go further to kind of maximize the integrity of our review process. All right. Compared to IJMRA, comparing IJMRA and Journal of Mick Clifford's research, um, we would argue, in fact, it's, it, it's, um, hard to contest that ours will have a wider scope. It doesn't make it better than JMMR, but it just makes it just wider and and more inclusive um, than JMMR because not only will we publish um, empirical and non-empirical articles in the area of mixed, me mixed methods, but also multiple methods. Okay. At some point we're going to be posting an editorial which um, will give you our very inclusive definition of both mixed method research and multiple methods. <coughs> Before this webinar, I'm going to focus on mixed reference research articles. All right, so what does it take to publish in IJMRA? Good question. I'm glad you asked me that. So, one thing is to kind of um, recognize the mixed methods, how, you know, what it is, what it looks like. Um, and one definition we're going to use is the one with uh, Doug Johnson, myself, and his, his very, very um, nice wife um, on mixed methods. Um, you know, um, I would define mixed methods research. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty broad definition. Um, and I won't read it, but uh, I'll pull it up for, for, for a few minutes, uh, for a minute or two, so you can, you can kind of look at it. Um, but essentially, we're not just going to define it um, in a narrow way that some journals define it or some authors define it as just qualitative and quantitative data collection analysis and interpretation. Um, but for example, it could be something where you start off collecting qualitative data, but by transforming that, those data, you can um, transform your study into a mixed methods research study. Okay, and the second part of this definition is as follows there. Um, but again, if you um, we'll have that posted at some point soon, and but it's also in our in our article. Okay, so that makes it uh, more inclusive for all of you, um, <coughs> and just also to emphasise that we will publish both empirical, which um, you know where there will be a method results discussion section, as well as non-empirical. Non-empirical could be theoretical. It could be conceptual, it could be methodological, okay, about mixed method research and, of course, multiple research. Okay, so um, we thought that um, a good way to kind of give you guidelines as to what we're looking for uh, is to use an evidence based study. This is something that um, we introduced this before, but unfortunately, we didn't get it recorded. Um, so it's a nice opportunity to revisit it. Um, this is an article I wrote with Cheryl Post when we were guest editors of two mixed method special issues for the International Journal of Quantitative Methods, of course, that IIQM owns. <coughs> and um, essentially, we looked at 45 reviews um, that were made on across the 16 manuscripts submitted to these special issues and using mixed method research techniques, um, we identified six meta themes and each one of those I'll, I'll describe. So it's warranted, warrantedness, justification, writing quality, transparency, integration, and philosophical lens. And these um, meta themes, these, these reflected what the reviews were saying, you know, whether it was critical or whether it was um, 
a craze. Um, it was fell on the typically fell on the one of those six areas. So we start with Warrington Ness, and from there we developed um, we developed kind of a checklist that we're hoping it will not only help authors but help reviewers as well. And also, you know, I also sent it to, to, to Mike Fetters, who is the editor of General Network Research, and he liked it, and I think he got it translated into Japanese. So, so I think they're using it over in Japan as well, because they have a very active mixed method research association. Um, <coughs> anyway, so Warrington Ness, um, it's kind of giving um, support, giving evidence for any claims that you make. Okay, so that's important. We don't want to have an author um, saying something that's you know kind of factual or based on a finding um, or concept or uh, interpretation that somebody else came up with without the appropriate um, you know support, and that seems like an obvious kind of um, standard. But you'd be surprised how many um, authors don't do that at least consistently. Okay. Um, finally, it's, it's yeah, we have to be so careful when we when we present mixed method research because findings are more complex, same with multiple methods, because you're going to have findings coming from different strands, different components, different phases. And if we don't make each the findings from each phase clear, <coughs> we're going to lose our audience, especially our reviewers. So that's really really important that um, you clear. And, and and one way of doing that is by using you know, clear demarcations like subheadings and, and so forth to to point that out um, so the readers know where the findings come from, from what phase of the findings come from. Um, very big believer in um, providing one or more visual displays, okay? Because if you can draw it, you can explain it. It's kind of the motto I use. Um, to make sure that any sources are both adequate and sufficiently recent. So, um, over the years, I've seen some people um, you know, write some good articles. However, it was grounded in um, articles or books, etc., book chapters that are kind of old. <coughs> and so they ended up having um, submitting a piece, a manuscript that wasn't particularly um, cutting edge. Or that has been revisited before. So it's really, really important that um, you cite some of the most, the more recent work in that area. Um, now, it, I do want to point out with a caveat that it doesn't have to be all of it new. In fact, I would argue that um, you should always try to cite classic works um, in the field. Um, and it's always nice, like, for example, in the literature review, if you could trace the origin. Of that particular concept, um, finding, etc. But you certainly want don't want to be accused of having a a um, you know citing sources that are where too many of them are old, but not sufficiently recent. <coughs> terms are important, so um, where possible, any any new or terms that are unconventional, you know, it's a good idea to. Um, Define them, describe them, maybe give an example, and certainly a citation. Okay. Um, five, I kind of covered a little bit uh, just now, so I'll skip on to six. Um, this is more of a technical issue. You'd be surprised how many, how many authors um, make what are called reference list errors and citation errors, number seven. In fact, in other works, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, we found that 92% of the authors commit citation errors. So don't forget, on our board, it's going to be some very big names of reviewers. Uh, it's going to be like a who's who. So if you're citing them and, for example, you misspell their name, that's not going to be good. We're all human, and if the reviewer sees that, they might question, then question how many other names have they uh, miscited. So moving on to the next set on the justification. Um, it's important that the manuscript is developed. I see sometimes that an author, let's say it's an, a non-empirical study, uh, not study, non-empirical work, 
uh, methodological, conceptual, theoretical, etc. And essentially, they they may have a great start, and then they get sidetracked in what they're writing, and then they don't really get back, come back to the central point, and so end up with a manuscript that's not sufficiently developed, um, which is which is always you know a disappointment. So. And, and I've seen over the years many manuscripts, not just in mixed methods elsewhere, get rejected because of that lack of development. If it's a study number nine, what what is the benefit? What's the so what of your study? It might be obvious to you, but it's not always obvious to the reader without prompting. Um, also, you know, it, it's always nice if you could um, show how the manuscript uh, advances qualitative and or quantitative research. <coughs> because in mixed method research articles, you're going to have at least one of those um, traditions represented. Um, so um, it's good to do that. And obviously, make sure within those two strands that you're citing the most relevant um, literature, relevant and current, uh, as it dictates. And as well as number 11, the advantage of expected research. So that's a good place to put that is, if you put it somewhere in the body, um, you know, it's important to put it in the conclusion section of whether it's an empirical article or non-empirical article, kind of, um, let the readers know. Um, and if you told them that before, remind them why it's, you know, important, the work is important and, what contribution it makes to the mixed method research community. <coughs> um, rationale um, of the study and the rationale for mixing, that's important because it's I see too many people leave that out. They say, oh, this is a mixed method study, this is obvious. And it's not always obvious. Most of us in the mixed method research community um, really privilege the research question um, as to why, um, as to you know, driving the design and everything else thereafter. Um, but you know, why should your study be involved both quantitative and qualitative or multiple forms of quantitative or multiple forms of qualitative? Um, it's important to kind of make that clear, you know, versus conducting a mono-method study. And what is the purpose of your statement? Every study, every empirical study has a purpose statement, but not, it's not always clearly stated. <coughs> um, <coughs> These next um, six items refer to writing, uh, making that clear. I'm going to say more about that later, so I'm going to skip that and move on to the next set, which is transparency. And that's important. <coughs> In fact, that's consistent with the American Education Research Association, where they say warrantedness and transparency are the two central. Um, goals of, of, of authors in, in writing. So in this case, transparency refers to making clear your design, your data collection, analysis that you use, your, et cetera. You know, um, you don't want it to be in a situation where you're saying the findings are and the authors don't really know how they came about. So it'd be hard to replicate. And the test of transparency, I always tell my students, is I, if I, I should be able to take your method section and replicate your study without asking you any questions. And for every question I have to ask that author, for me, suggests that um, it lacks transparency in that area. So just uh, be very careful to make sure um, that you know, your design, sampling, data collection, analysis, and so forth are clear. And I, I, I've worked with enough of you to know that, you know, they get very frustrated when you have that lack of clarity. Um, tables and figures, um, I'm a big believer in having one or more of those in, in almost every manuscript. Um, but <coughs> it's very important you just don't, don't stick them in. How a good, how a knife, how a piece. So as images are, it's very important that you describe it sufficiently in the text. Um, so you don't force the reader to be to play detective as to what the figure or table represents and what the high points are. <coughs> if it's a study, what's your direction for future research? If it's not empirical, what are the implications 
where do where should we go next? Okay, and then it's good to have a conclusion where that's warranted. In terms of integration, this is becoming more and more important. Um, I know speaking with, with Mike Fetter from Jose um, um, Zara Azuan, it's very, very becoming a big issue now in that we need to show um, where the um, integration takes place, um, the points of interface, as guests would say, um, take place, and how they're integrated. So they should be talking to each other. If, they, if a mixed method study reads like two different studies in one, then um, you, you reduce your chances of it getting accepted. Um, so the application, um, number 29, should be clear and adequate. And the legitimation issues. <coughs> there are quite a few legitimation issues now that have been written about. Uh, myself and Burke have an article, and, and um, there's a really nice article um, by Alicia Okafor in the Handbook of Mixed Method Research. Um, and there's several others that do that. Um, and so it's something to look at that because every single study has a situation issue, doesn't matter how well designed it, they are, and certainly every single mixed method research. So to ignore that discussion um, is not a good idea and it might always unacceptable withdraw criticism. So the last two come on the philosophical lens. Okay, making sure that you make transparent your research philosophy. You know, is it critical? Realism, some form of pragmatism, uh, transformative, um, and so forth. And 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 many of these, um, these especially the mixed methods research philosophy, but e even the ones associated more with qualitative and quantitative, usually have components, and they might differ actually in important ways. So, for example, social constructivism is different to social constructionism. Um, if you're saying you're a critical theorist, what type of critical fear. We talk about feminism, critical race theory, critical discourse, and so forth. Making that clear, and with the appropriate citation. Okay, So it's really important that we cite those who came up with those philosophies, those who have advanced it, and not just cite someone who has summarized it. So um, I always criticize my students if, some, if they cite me, for example, um, on a philosophy that I didn't come up with. Um, and I say you need to go to the original source, not be lazy, and cite that person. Because I know we all would like to cite, be cited if we came up with something. So that's that's really important, and that's also important in a non empirical article to make clear what your what your lens is. <clears throat> Two other um, typologies or frameworks you might consider using um, are here, and of course these these slides are going to be made available. Um, and the second one, um, which is myself and Julie, who is a writing star from, in Canada. Um, I'm sure members of IQM know her. She's a doctor student still. And um, we wrote this kind of um, article where we divided the framework. We went to the different phases of a study, 35, 13 phases, um, that Kathy Collins, myself, and, and then for each of identified. And of the mixed method research process and just basically um, try to um, be quite specific, quite micro as, as possible as the page length allowed us, um, you know, for each of these 13 areas. And this is just one, this is just the first couple of um, phases. So the first one, determine the goal of the study and then the research objectives and then the rationale, which goes on to the next page. Okay, so that's an article of um, which um, I couldn't put up because it's not it's not open access. But anyone individual um, sends me an article individually, sends me an email individual, I'll be happy to send that to them. And here you have these links are all live. I'm not going to hit them. But there we have um, in research of the schools the other journal I covered it. We write um, almost every issue. We write um, editorial, and you might find one or more of these useful. Um, these are all evidence based, so we actually collect analyze and interpret data. So for example, in this first one on APA errors, um, we've identified the 60 most common APA errors. 
So rather than get the APA book and read it, you can, you know, perhaps start with the the most common one, which is numbers, and then you work on from there. And and once you you get to know those rules, you start to cover your basics. We also found that, for example, that um, those who commit, I think, it's eight or more different APA errors are three times more likely to have their manuscript rejected. Okay, and so we're not sure whether this causal this relationship is causal, but certainly based on reviewer comments, I, for some reviewers have low tolerance for APA errors, for them it might be causal that they might influence in a negative way their decision. Okay. And because of this, some of these articles APA have, and they ask us to write a blog, I think we have a, a screenshot on the next slide. <coughs> we have articles about writing abstracts, creating tables. This one here, how many citations um, would be useful? And I mean, that's evidence-based as well. And citation errors and references to errors. Um, for, for example, those who commit four more citation errors are three times more likely to have the article rejected. Um, we have an article readability. Um, Microsoft Word and a few other um, programs give that information um, of readability, flesh Kincaid, and flesh reading ease. And we found that there's certain criteria cut points that make your manuscript more likely to be rejected if you fall outside those cut points. Then we have an article on verbs um, that several people I've met over the years have told me it's useful. Um, so we have a Typology, we have about five or six tables um, and figures on that manuscript, sorry, in that article, um, where we break verbs down into different types of verbs, where which verbs are tend to be more cited in different phases of the study, um, as well as the strength of verbs. So, for example, it is um, a lot um, less emphasis to say somebody stated than to say somebody exclaimed or cried out or shouted. So like, we think that's useful not only for um, you know, your literature review and your discussion section, but even for your findings, um, especially in qualitative work or qualitative phases where you're trying to provide thick rich description. And um, have an article on link words that we found, or I found that um, use of link words um, predicts whether a manuscript will be rejected or accepted, and identify the most common link words were used in our journal by authors. And not on here, but something I have actually have under review um, for possible publication is something on grammar, where um, I actually presented that at the American Education Research Association in a couple of weeks, um, where um, identified the most common grammatical errors, and again, the ones that are associated with manuscript rejection um, slash acceptance. So, um, so we have a lot of articles. We're going to continue to write more. So for those who are, okay, if you're if you're a strong writer, don't worry about this. But if if you're not, um, you might find one or more of these useful. All right. So that's a blog that we wrote. The four of us, myself, um, Professor John Slate, Julie Combs, and Rebecca Frells. Um, and Rebecca was a doctor student at the time. And then that's the first. Um, Three most common APA errors. You see numbers here a little bit more than fifty percent, which is a high number. You think that one in two people make errors on numbers, um, and hyphenation, and then at all, and then um, so that's. I'm looking at the time, so so I think we're coming to the stopping point. So again, happy writing, and uh, as they say, whether or not you write well, write bravely. And that's my contact information, um, tonyobrizetl.com. So um, I will bring it over to you, Yvette. Looks like we have about 25 minutes or so for questions, which is what I wanted. So I hope you found some of that useful, and, but please feel free to ask questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tony, for that great presentation. So we'll now open the floor up for questions. So if you do have a question or a question, you can raise your hand or you can type in the chat. Yeah. 
don't tell me you're shy. Hi, Amit. Thank you for your excellent question. Um, yes, absolutely, yes. Um, so we, I would say that might be considered a methodological based paper, and you don't need to have findings at all. And we very welcome anything that's novel. Um, it could even be something that's existing that is applied to a novel situation, a novel context. So, <coughs> so yes, if you have a manuscript in mind, please save it for our journal. Don't send it to anywhere else, um, um, so that we can we can take a look at it. No, we're very we're very bored. Good question again. Um, thanks, Mohammed. Um, <clears throat> no, the topic could be any topic. So uh, it could be social sciences, social behavioral sciences. It could be education. It could be um, science, health, um, the arts. <coughs> In fact, one of, one of my associate editors is an art space researcher, Mandy Archibald, for example. So we welcome an array of genres. Also, it could be a quantitative um, methodology or qualitative methodology. You show how you use it in, and how it could be used in, in, you know, by a multiple method or mixed method framework. What is the word limit for the articles? Good question. Um, our word limit is going to be 10,000 words for both um, empirical and non-empirical articles. I think um, JMMR has 8,000 for, I think it's the empirical and 10,000 for non-empirical, but we're going to make it 10,000 for each. Um, easy to remember. Um, and that hopefully will be enough to um, kind of tell your story or get your methodological point across. Um, so, and that's, you know, it's up there. I mean, um, few journals have it as many as 10,000 for, for all manuscripts. So thank you for asking that question. Okay, and we've got another question from Mohammed and Miriam Farzad. Thanks very much for your answer. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Of, of course, assuming it's you know well written, etc. Um, um, applied linguistics is something that I think it's I don't see as many applications um, in that area. So um, very much welcome that. Um, and the pleasure of of going to a applied linguistics um, conference in Mexico. I did a keynote address there in last July, and I'm, you know I tried my best to um, to promote mixed methods, you know, in the field of 
of uh, linguistics and psycholinguistics. So, so yes, please send your manuscript. I mean, I'm sending it right now once you get the call from us in a few weeks. Okay, and our next question comes from Judith Suderman. Any advice on describing design? You have no but remain respectful of all the other views on Oh, a great question. Um, design is probably um, our most, um, you know, there's the most work being done in it. I mean, I think there's more than 50 different recent designs. Virtually every author who writes about mixed method, every mixed methodologist has um, his or her own or their own design. Um, so it's, you know, it's a good idea to, um, if you use that design, then um, make sure you cite it, make sure you describe it. It's a good idea to try and draw it, in my opinion. Because again, if you draw it, you could explain it. And so by doing that, you can um, essentially, you know, make it transparent. I you know that's one of the meta themes that came up in our study to the, to the reviewers and subsequently to the readers. And a lot of times you might find that, you know, be careful though, because one of the criticisms I know guests had a great article in General Mixed Method Research um, on mixed method design. Be careful about that because some of our works, including mine, might falsely give the impression that this is like covers everything. And, and there's almost an infinite amount of designs you can have in mixed method research. These are just the ones that we kind of write about are probably the more common ones. But if you find that your design does not fit anyone specifically, it's okay. It's okay, for example, to combine two or more design typologies. It's okay not to use a typology at all, as long as you make it clear <coughs> your design. So I just want to make that clear, um, because that sometimes is a, some of my students, you know, get the impression that you have to use this person, you have to fit exactly, and they get frustrated if it doesn't. So um, my friend and colleague, Bert Johnson, would say that uh, we empower you to come up with your own designs. And if you have a new design, maybe that will form another article that you could, a manuscript that you could submit to our journal. I see that was Tim. So hi, Tim. Tim is, I think, the managing editor of General Mixed Method Research. So it's kind of nice to see him um, that he's here. And uh, one really nice thing that we have that wasn't there before <coughs> is that because we're all from the same community, mixed method research, we're going to be um, collaborating and communicating between um, the editors of General Mixed Method Research and the editors of IJMRA. Um, <coughs> in fact, we plan to provide a link in our website to JMMR. If we don't see them as competitors, we see them as, as um, allies, we see them as um, collaborators that we can help to get the mixed method um, and multiple method research um, ideas across to the world. So, so um, I really had meetings with Mike Fetters about it. In fact, he, he told me that um, for any good manuscripts that he rejects because of lack of space, he will recommend they send it to our journal and we'll do the same. So thanks, Tim, and hi. <laughs> Uh, nowadays, mixed methods can be applicable to research. Yes. Um, in fact, there's a book out now, a stage book by uh, Mike Hayabert and colleagues. I think it's H A Y V A E L T. Um, anyway, if you if you if you Google, you know, mixed method research synthesis, it should come up. The stage publication. As I said, um, on that, um, I've done a little bit of work in terms of articles on, on synthesis, and a few others have. And in their book, they uh, I think they identified, I can't remember now, a dozen or 14 different um, frameworks for synthesizing mixed research. <coughs> so we absolutely would love it. In fact, we, we, we actually like it, we as editors on IGMO, and we like it when um, authors and researchers apply. Um, mixed method techniques are different phases of the, of the study because it's such a flexible tool that it doesn't only have to be used for the research itself, 
It could be used for other favors. Jane Christie, after going on the Yes, we have um we had a discussion of that today, so it's a very timely question. So I guess this we can, I can announce this because we all agree, um, the, the team of editors. Um sometime next year, probably late next year, probably the last the last issue of next year, we plan to have a special issue um, that comes out of the, the regional conferences um, of this year. So, so far we have Jamaica next week, we have, South, um, we have um, Japan the first week in August, and we have South Africa, Johannesburg, um, the last few days of August, I think from the 30th to about September the 1st. So, um, they don't even know this yet, so this is a brand new announcement part of the press, as they call it. So we're going to um, so so if any of you are able to make those conferences and you have a paper that you present, um, whether it's a paper, whether it's a workshop, etc., um, we would very much you know when we get when we send out the call, we want you to submit that to IJMRA and be a special issue. Um, in terms of other special issues, we don't have anything else right now, but we do know. And after this big one, we're going to do the first inaugural one. At least our next couple, two or three, are going to be regular issues. <coughs> because down the road, what we want to do, because IGMI went dormant last year, it lost its impact factor, and we want to get that back, and we want to get that back with a vengeance, and um, and so um, you know make that very high, so that like JMMRs is very high, two point something. Um, we want at least above one to start off with. Um, it's going to take a couple of years before we get that back, um, probably 2018 or, or longer, but. Um, we're not in control of that. However, we are in control of making sure that we publish quality manuscripts um, that are useful, interesting, um, and have implications for different people, for researchers throughout the world. So thank you for asking that, Jane. Carol Bentwright, I hope to see you. I would really like to begin. Oh, hi, Carol. Yes, that'd be great. If I had, a, I had a little anxiety attack there, just a really mini one, because I know I start to work on my, my keynote address and workshop this rest of this week, but uh, I'll make that happen. But yes, I'm looking forward to meeting you and, um, and everybody else is going to Jamaica. And, and quite a few of us on the board are going to it. Um, for example, Burke Johnson is going, John Hitchcock is going. And they're doing um, workshops there. So you're going to have a lot of workshops for people to go. <coughs> I really encourage you to attend one or more of these workshops because um, these guys are, are very um, experienced writers, researchers, authors. And uh, you, you will pick up some things, I think, there that will help you design a study better or, or write an article better. So thanks, Carol. So you, you had a, a statement about you like to begin publishing cow. Yes, that's we would very much welcome that. So um it might seem a little scary um at first, but um you know if you certainly seek help or you need it, um guidance from others who have published before. Um also you might want to consider early on, you might want to consider co-authoring uh, you know your follicle if you're finding it um challenging to write. Um, you still be lead author, but get a more experienced second author. <coughs> so, um, you know, I look forward to receiving your first manuscript. So you say never published for yet. <clears throat> yeah, the same same comment basically. Um, you know, um it's a process. Um I given a webinar in September um on how to publish, you know, uh kind of fairly steps of publishing. And um, you know, so 
you might want to consider joining that. I would be happy to give you the details if you email me. Um, but there are many, many people you can, you know, as I say, going through workshops is going to help you. Um, and um, working with a mentor if you have one. I know in different communities, not everyone has access to a mentor. Um, so if you can't get a mentor, uh, next best thing is get a call offer. From Muhammad, you mentioned a book on mind. You repeat, or could you repeat the name again? I actually can't remember the name. I'd have to, I'd have to Google it. Um, but it's by by Mike Hyvert. I think H A Y V A E R T. Um, it came out last year. Um, it's a Sage publication. Um. And so, if anyone um, knows the name, can, if you could type it in, I would really appreciate it. Um, I would do it myself, but I don't want to be accused of being off task. I'm very, very strict on that. It will punish me if I, if I, if I go off task. Um, but it's an excellent book. In fact, he gave a, he gave a presentation of it last year at the American Education Research Association. Um, kind of, you know, the high point of the book. So, and it's an easy, it's a nice read. Sage paperback. Okay, someone's got using mixed method research institutes for literature. Thank you, Jane, for that. Oh, I didn't know you you attended it, Carol. I'm so sorry. So we have met. Um, that's good. Good that you're attending workshops. I think that's going to um, really hold you in good stead. I I still attend workshops um, whenever I get the chance. Um, I always learn so much from, from every workshop I attend. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, hey, hey, there's all. I think I would, yeah, so I got the spelling close. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it's EY, not AY. I think that's only, that's the, so my apologies, Mike, there. Um, use of mixed synthesis and lit reviews at the same publication. Um, <coughs> And in there, you see he cites other kind of articles that are in the area of mixed method research services. Um, people like Margarita Sandalowski has worked in that area, um, and so forth. So, recommend it. We've got a few minutes left. Are there any last questions? You can type them in now. Oh, thanks, Carol, for your comment about the workshop. I'm glad you found it helpful. I had a lot of fun. I did Cindy Benj and um, and Bert Johnson, um, who co-presented with me. The presenter will be Peggy Shannon Baker, and her topic will be applications of mixed education. You can check out the IAQM website, iaqm.ualberta.org, and we'll have the registration of in early April. And we have a question from Sebastian Zimmer. Hi, Tony. How long do you find your papers? That is a good question. Um, you know, we can't really give anything definitive right now because we're still getting, you know, because remember, we're restarting this journal from absolute scratch. We don't even have a publisher at this point. So we're going to do all the work ourselves from start to finish. But, you know, we, we expect it to be fast. Um, you know, we expect, I would, if I had to put a window, I'd say three to six months. To get the first round, to get the first round of decisions, hopefully it's closer to three. Um, but again, it obviously depends on how quickly we get the reviews from um, the board members. So if you are on the board, you now I would urge you to um, to be very um, you know diligent in, in returning reviews as timely as possible. 
Um, having said that, I'm not the best at doing that. I have to leave until the last minute. Um, but as Tim would, I'm sure Tim would have very pie. But, um, but essentially, it's um, so that's important. So, but hopefully, three months, four months, you'll get the first. Um, you know, you get the first round, and if it's a revised and resubmit or accept your revisions, then you know the next time it will be even faster if you revise the manuscript as well. Um, so I hope that helps. But but right now we you know we're still in fact we're still as I said earlier we're still um, building up our editorial review board. So um, so thanks for asking that question. Got no other questions coming in. Uh, Tony, I'd like to thank you very much for giving us the presentation today. A lot of good information was shared. Um, coming up in June, we have the 17th annual Think and Call Thinking Workshop Series takes place here in Edmonton, Alberta. From June 9th to the 23rd, we'll have a lot of different workshops. Thank you for having me. That out that the IAQ registration is now open. And with that, Tony, do you have any last words? Yeah, thank, thank you again, Yvette, for, um, for arranging this. Thank you to all of you for, I know how busy you all are, for taking the time to listen. I hope you found it worthwhile. And, and you know, it's just the beginning of our conversation because this is an emerging development.